Well, I, I really, uh, I didn't struggle, but I really prayed about <clears throat> what the Lord wanted me to say tonight. And uh, I, I have settled on 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 through 8, if you want to be turning there. And as I was uh, riding to breakfast this morning, I was listening to to a gentleman preaching and he said, you know, throw away all those old notes that you have, uh, get something fresh. <laughs> I thought, is that from you, Lord, or is that some intellectual idiot that wants to intimidate me? <laughs> so uh, I apologize if... Uh, I'm using uh, some bread that may be a little crusty, but I trust that it will still be the, uh, the word of God that we need to hear tonight. And I'm convinced that in every meeting when we come together, God has something he wants to, to say to us, whether it's through the music or through the prayer time or through the message, through his word, whatever. We ought to be listening. Because God has something he wants to say to us. And I, I must mention, if you were here today around noon to help inspect the roof, as Gary and I were, then you are fed very well. Ms. Mary Maston fed us, and I'm telling you, it was delicious. The only problem, Ms. Mary, is when I got home, I told my wife, she said, why didn't you bring me some? <laughs> But it was very good and it was very refreshing, and uh, I'm thankful for that. Well, let's uh, read the scripture. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6, 7, and 8. For I am now ready to be offered. The time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. Let's pray. Lord, we pray today that you, by your spirit, through your precious word, will help us to understand and know exactly what you want us to hear and understand, and Lord, may we make application of that in our lives. We are thankful, Lord, that our pastor and his wife are better. We pray that you would continue to bless them and bless the ministry of this church. I pray, Lord, that we will understand your purpose and we will have a vision of what, Lord, you want to accomplish in this place in order that we may be part of it. And may we labor faithfully in your service. Bless us together, we pray, and give us insight and understanding, for we ask it in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Well, this, to some people, this passage of Scripture is a little depressing, because if you're uh, knowledgeable at all about the Scripture, you know that basically the Apostle Paul is saying, this is the end. My life on earth is finished. My work is concluded. However, I think it's more than what we can interpret with our human understanding. I think the Apostle Paul by the Holy Spirit is trying to tell us, look, there is some greater things ahead. And because there are greater things ahead, be faithful where you are right now. All of us have probably encountered people, and maybe we have even been part of this group I'm about to identify. I'm sure I have at times. When you first got saved, you were ready to do anything. You were ready to go anywhere. In fact, I, I heard a missionary speak at a summer camp who said, when I got saved, I was ready to go to Africa for Jesus. In fact, he ended up going to Africa for Jesus. But that's the way new believers feel. They're excited about their new faith in Christ. And 
uh, they just have that spiritual exuberance that that's contagious. You feel it and you sense it in the room. And then after a few years, maybe things begin to kind of cover over and life becomes a little bit boring and maybe difficulties come and we get discouraged and we're not as excited, we're not as animated as we used to be for the cause of Christ. You probably know someone like that, maybe even right now. I hope we're not that way right now. I hope we're excited. We recognize what God has done for us, and we're excited about what God is continuing to do in our midst. I uh, copied down what William Barclay said about this particular passage of Scripture, and I want to read it to you. William Barclay writes, it is easy to begin, but hard to finish. One thing necessary for life is staying power. That's what so many lack. Very, a very famous man refused to allow his biography to be written while he was alive. He says this in quotes, I have seen so many men fall out on the last day. Why do so many fall out in the race of life? Because the race for the Christian is a marathon. It's not a sprint. It goes on and on and on. And in these words that I read to you from 2 Timothy, Paul is trying to encourage us to understand some things. He wants us to know that we're to actually face the reality that's before us. He knew that the end was near, but there was more that needed to be done. It was painful for him to think that he would be leaving his friends. He would not be able to travel to the churches that he had established. But he knew that God would take care of everything. He faced the reality that this was the will of God, this was the purpose of God, and that he was willing to deal with what he had to deal with. I uh, have been reading a, a book, in fact I've been reading it for several weeks. It's one of those books you just don't sit down and read a chapter in 30 minutes or an hour, you have to kind of soak it up as you go. And basically, it's about the Apostle Paul's words from Philippians 1.21, to live is Christ, to die is gain. And I know that is foreign to our minds at this point of our life because we want to live. But God's promise is that, as a believer, we have a promising future. We have a tomorrow that we can count on that will be better than any today has ever been. And so the Apostle Paul is not trying to be morbid or discouraging in what he is saying, but he's saying, I'm ready. I'm prepared. And I believe that's his instruction to us tonight. Be ready, be prepared. Because we do not know the day or the hour. And in the meantime, be committed, he says in this next verse. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Be committed to finish what we start. Fight the good fight. We have to be tough. Being a Christian these days is not easy. I, uh, I know that everywhere we turn, there seems to be those who would stand against us. I tell you, we have some, we have some election issues that, uh, that we're dealing with in Arkansas right now. And evil is rearing its ugly head and even making fun of people who would oppose the legalization 
of marijuana. But I want to tell you, the church needs to stand up. It's a fight worth fighting. We're to be committed to the moral principles of the Scripture. And I don't care how beneficial, money-wise, it may seem, it's not worth the price. And I'm not a politician, and I'm not running for anything, but i got to share this statistic because it really stuck in my mind when I was at a, a meeting to, uh, to understand and try to learn some of these things. I heard these statistics. Colorado has had recreational marijuana for 10 years. But for every dollar they get in tax revenue, they spend $4.50. In extra law enforcement, medical care, all, all the traumas that uh, come with recreational marijuana. And I want to tell you, I heard a Christian, I, I, I say a Christian, I thought they were a Christian, say today, I'm voting for that. I think it's good. Our police need the money. Well, we need to be committed to holy and higher things as God's people. I'll get off that soapbox, okay? I didn't intend to get started with that. You forgive me if I need to be forgiven. But he says, I have fought a good fight. I have finished the course. Everybody needs a plan for their life. We need to sit down and think about where God wants us to go and what God wants us to do and see if we can't determine the way that God wants us to carry that out. I do not believe that faith is blind. I believe that God gives us faith to trust His will and His purpose, and He gives us understanding and instruction if we'll listen to Him, especially as we spend time in His Word. Paul says, I have kept the faith. I have continued to walk with God. So important in our Christian lives is to not forget the basics. We need God's Word implanted in our hearts on a daily, if not more than daily, time frame. We need time spent in prayer, public and private prayer. We need to spend time in meditation, thinking about the things of God, what God would have us to do. And so we have to face reality. We have to be committed to the cause of Christ. And then Paul in this eighth verse says this, Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but in all them that love his appearing. Paul is saying we need to focus on the future. We need to think about tomorrow. And I know that sometimes that's difficulty, but he knows that there's rewards that are in store for the righteous. Now, I know that some people say, well, when you talk about rewards, you're, you're trying to incentivize, incentivize people on the basis of something that's going to happen to them that's good. Some monetary reward or some crown as the scripture describes it. But you know as a believer what we're going to do with those crowns that we're blessed with, don't you? We're going to lay them at the feet of Jesus. That's what the scripture says. Because he and he only is the one that ought to receive our praise and glory and worship and honor. And we want to give everything we have because we're there, we're here because of Christ. There are struggles ahead. There are difficulties ahead. The Apostle Paul is a great example of all the difficulties he encountered. Many of you are familiar with all of those things. But he did them gladly, knowing that God had a purpose in everything. And he kept his eyes on the goal. He kept pressing forward. I think sometimes that God wants us to simply say, 
look at what I want to do through you, and you keep your eyes on me, and you keep moving forward doing what I have called you to do. Because God has called every one of us. There is a future plan for every one of us. And when God is finished, he'll take us home. And the Apostle Paul is, is appealing to us, I believe, in this testimony of his by simply saying, there's a grand new day coming, and it's going to be a glorious day. It's going to be a blessing. It's going to be a blessed day. Lastly, this, this evening, Paul mentions in this eighth verse, he says, not to me only, but to all them also that love his appearing. Sometimes we think we're alone. But I want to tell you, we're not alone. We are never alone. We have the presence of God's Spirit that dwells within us. But let me tell you, there are believers everywhere. There are folks who still hold to the truth, who still uphold the Word of God as the Holy Scripture. There are still people out there that God has in places of importance. I love the example of the old prophet that thought he was by himself and God said, just look, I want you to open up the windows. I want, I want you to see what all is going on, to see all those that have not bowed a knee to Baal, and to see all the hosts of heaven that are on your side. We're not alone. We have the promise of the abiding Spirit of God and the presence of those of us who still have flesh on to encourage each other, and to help each other along the way. I know it's uh, tempting sometimes to want to give up and quit. And we, 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 have seen, uh, we have seen quitters. I'll never forget, I was a junior in high school, and I decided I wanted to play basketball for Gail Condar, famous basketball coach. And I went out, and I made the team. But they required that we practice on Sunday. And my dad, being a Baptist preacher, that didn't go over real well. So I told the coach, I said, Coach, I can't, uh, I can't practice on Sunday. He said, okay. And then... A friend of mine shared with me that because I had stood up for that, he surrendered his Sunday practices. But my assistant coaches always accused me of being a quitter. Now, it wasn't because I was a great basketball player. Because I was playing on a team in my junior year that had four All-Staters and an All-American. And if I called their names, you would probably know them. But God calls us to not be quitters. He wants us to stay in the game. There are two examples very quickly. Elijah... When the queen got a hold of her and I got a hold of him, and I can't even think of the queen's name. Jezebel, thank you. This is a participation sermon. <laughs> now you know, Gary Bell, why we have to stay off the roof. <laughs> we get up there and forget what we're doing. But Elijah threatened Jezebel, or, or Jezebel threatened Elijah. 
And you know what his reaction was? So let me tell you, this is a great example. Sometimes we think we're, we're failures and we just, God's not going to trust us with anything. You know what Elijah did when that woman got after him? He ran and he said, Lord, I can't take this. Just take me home. Just take my life. He gave up. There's another example from Numbers chapter 11 that uh, Moses was ready to quit. The children of Israel didn't have anything to eat. They came complaining. And Moses said, look, Lord, I'm tired of this. You get somebody else. I can't put up with this anymore. I'm ready to quit. But the exciting thing is this, Elijah didn't quit and Moses didn't quit. They just displayed their humanity. But God was able to use them to bring about his glory and his purpose in their life. And that's what I find exciting about the day in which we live. God has a purpose and a plan. And he wants us to stay faithful to the end. He doesn't want us to quit. I trust and pray tonight that you will be enthused about what God has done in your life and you'll stay put. And you'll look to see where he wants you to serve and to be a witness for him in his church. Well, I don't know. The, the preacher may not let me come back since I don't take the whole 30 minutes. But thank you for listening to me tonight. And uh, I'll just tell you, I love our pastor and I respect him and I pray for him every day. And I trust that you will also. Father, we pray tonight that you'll forgive us of our failures and there are many and forgive us of our sin and there are many and cleanse us and make us the servant that you want us to be and may we not give up may we not be quitters may we keep on keeping up until Jesus comes again until or until we stand in your presence some glorious day. Thank you, Lord, for all the preparation you have made to redeem us and to care for us and to see us safely home. We rejoice in Jesus tonight, for it's in his name we pray. Amen. We thank you for joining us this evening at Rahil Baptist Church, and may God richly bless you.